Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be with you, um, excellencies, colleagues, and friends. Unfortunately, I couldn't be uh, in Kigali with you, but I'll try and sort of make up for that. Uh, I just want to underline a lot of what Tasneem said. Uh, we are at a very critical juncture at the current point of time and equity, justice, and access to sustainable development are actually central to where we have to go, uh, both as humanity and as peoples across the world. Uh, I'm going to speak from, let's say, uh, two cycles of the IPCC. I've had the fortune of being a CLA, both in the AR5 and the AR6 cycle. Uh, and also, as Sasim said, I co-led the chapter on solutions in the 1.5 report. We are not doing very well compared to what we said at that point of time. And I also co-led um, the uh, chapter on climate resilient development, which I'm going to be speaking about um, very briefly just now. So I guess the big challenge for us, and Tasneem has laid this out very well, is the global context. You know, the global context, even when this process started about 30 years ago uh, at Rio, where some of us were there, was quite, quite different from where we are just now. So the world is in serious trouble. Uh, and, and the biggest challenge, I think, for us as climate scientists, especially uh, WCRP, is that we have limited foresights uh, into the places where action can be taken. I think that is really the call to action just now, that we have the tools, we have the science, the science is speaking very, very explicitly at the global and regional scale, but we have to take it down where action is actually happening pretty much across the world, but most of it is kind of uncoordinated uh, action. It's kind of action that does need a tremendous amount of support by the international community, by science, and of course, by local, regional, and national governments. So if you look at you know, the, the, the big picture here, this is the Sustainable Development Goals. I helped kind of negotiate this between 2013 and 15 at the UN. And I guess the core element in this goal, apart from all the 17 goals themselves, is the idea that no one, no place, and no ecosystem uh, should be left behind. I think this is especially important for uh, Africa, where we're speaking today, uh, and, you know, parts of Latin America and, and Asia, where th there are serious challenges that we are facing, not only on the climate front, but also the development front. The idea that climate would be part of this frame was an important part of the negotiations, but of course, the Paris Climate Agreement uh, took that much, much further. The challenge that we're facing today, and I let me show you the evidence on this, is that at the sort of midpoint of the SDGs, the SDGs were meant to be achieved by 2030, we're doing extremely badly. This is the overall dashboard that looks at the SDGs in 2023. We just closed the SDG summit in New York, um, you know, about a month ago. And climate action is not doing very, very well. It's, it's not saying that other things are doing well particularly, but that I think is a question that, you know, we have to really examine very critically. And that is there's an interconnection between what happens in the development space, whether it's energy or water or hunger or inequality, whether it's gender in, uh, inequality or economic inequality and of course, uh, climate action. In fact, um, the evidence is very clear at the moment. Uh, about two thirds of the goals have seen limited or no progress. About 20% of them are achieved and are more or less on track at global scale. And of course, unfortunately, some of them, especially the environmental goals are in, in reversal. So what is the kind of context we're dealing with economically across the world? The world at the moment has um, you know, economic output that adds up to about 100 trillion, growing at about two and a half percent per year in spite of all of the conflicts we're seeing at the moment, which are making life very difficult for, I would say, half or two thirds of the world. We have capital assets of about 550 trillion, again, growing at slightly lower pace, about two, two and a half, two percent per year. The big issue, of course, is that, and this is a report that we just released uh, about two weeks ago, it's the Global Climate Resilience Report um, for Infrastructure. And, you know, the, 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 the really shocking thing is our losses at the moment are about 1% per year. So if you're looking at a trillion dollar global output, we're losing about one, about 800 uh, billion to about a trillion a year. And, you know, two thirds to three fourths of that, there's some uncertainty in the numbers is because of climate. There's other things that also affect that. And climate impact as we are heading for a 1.5 overshoot, and God forbid, if you're heading for a two degree overshoot, is going to be a much more significant share of, of global losses. So this is the unfortunate uh, circumstance. This is where the data uh, looks at the current point of time in, in terms of economic uh, development and development per se. Uh, COVID, of course, has had a horrible impact on that, especially in low and um, middle income countries. And as we know, in a sense, compared to the kind of uh, populations that we have, 16% of the high income countries, that's G7 plus, uh, sort of 
draws in about 50% of the investments and produces 80% of the GDP. But if you look at the low income side, the differentials are very, very significant. And in, in fact, the unfortunate thing is they're actually growing and becoming worse and not becoming better. So, you know, climate action cannot be looked at at its own, whether it is uh, mitigation or adaptation, we have to really bring this together in the context of development, in the context of increasing inequality and unfortunately conflict. So basically the world is facing one of the most challenging times and most fragmented times since the Second World War uh, at the current point of time. So when we're negotiating, when we're looking at climate action, it has to be viewed um, in, in, in this context, whether it's resourcing or technology or, you know, really bringing together uh, climate action through the negotiations. This is the context that's there. So let me give you a very, very quick, I'll fly you through evidence on the SDGs. This is a quick graphic representation. This is looking at Germany, for example, towards the top end. Sweden, of course, is the, is the sort of top ranked uh, country in terms of SDGs. And if you just look at that thing that I've highlighted in the center, at uh, climate action, you see that some countries are doing better than others. Uh, but there is a context, there's a GDP context, there's a biocapacity context, and of course, there's a human development context. And one of the core questions, whether it's in the global north, where you know being able to get to net zero is going to have um, to mean that countries have to take very difficult choices in terms of social development, in terms of their consumption patterns. We have a you know we have interesting challenges. So that's Germany, that's the United Kingdom, and you can see here. You know, even though the UK has a per capita GDP of over fifty thousand dollars per capita, there are some of the SDGs, including hunger, including responsible consumption and and production, uh, apart from climate action, that you know the UK is quite quite challenged with. Similarly, the United States, you see more reds and browns here than there are no greens at all, or even oranges. So even you know one of the the largest economy in the world, about seventy thousand dollars per capita PPP, and a population of three hundred and about fifty million people is seriously challenged. So um, and if you look at Brazil, Brazil actually is doing pretty well in, in many in many contexts. This is in spite of you know, the, 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 the problems that we had over the last um, decade or so uh, in, in Brazil, especially in the Amazon. And you can see on renewables, even on climate action, we've seen a lot of positive steps on a whole range of other developmental trajectories. We're seeing improvements uh, in a large country uh, like Brazil. And that's China, of course, uh, doing pretty well on a whole range of counts, including on, on, on climate action. Um, and of course, obviously very strongly on human development and poverty reduction. In fact, the MDGs would not have happened without China's actions uh, over the last uh, you know three decades or so. That's South Africa, which is um, unfortunately in a rather difficult spot at the current point of time, uh, doing not very well on many counts, including uh, you know the big challenges they have in terms of the energy transition, and of course the implication that has on climate action and the need then to adapt. Uh, and that is my own country of India, which has surprisingly, in spite of its deep development challenges, made very strong commitments on some parts of the climate challenge, including uh, on the expansion of renewables uh, and whatever. So the reason I'm showing you this is we actually have objective measures now uh, over the last seven to 10 years, which are able to track progress along the SDGs, including climate action together um, at national level. And increasingly as uh, VRVs as a voluntary um, reports are coming in. We are finding that availability at the national level and sometimes at the local level, which I think is, in a sense, the forefront of where climate action is. But the key point I want to make here, here is that every country is a developing country. You know, you saw the difference between the UK, um, the US, Sweden, et cetera, et cetera, especially in relation to climate and biodiversity. And of course, like we heard the same say just now, systemic risk, whether it's in terms of conflict, it's, it's in terms of climate action, in terms of the biodiversity crisis, is growing exponentially. Now, if, because it's systemic risk, as climate scientists, we understand this quite well, it can only be addressed systemically and at the appropriate scale in a warming world. Now, this is where I think the real operational challenge for us is to take our work and our models from working at regional and maybe um, and, and global scale and taking it down into sort of uh, into an operationalizable space where people can actually act on it, where local governments, communities, uh, civil society, uh, and firms can work on this. So. The question, I guess, is how can climate science accelerate regional and local climate adaptation and mitigation? You know, it's fairly clear. We have the science here. This comes from um, the atlas that we have from the IPCC. This is looking at what happens at, in a 1.5 world. This is looking at the shift in a two degree world. I'm sort of replaying stuff that we've done over many years together. This is what's going to happen uh, in, in some senses uh, with SSP 3.7 um, at, at a three degree world. Now, the key question for us, and this is again a map um, that comes from that, that it's a population density. Uh, 
the real question that people are asking across the world is, what is happening in my city, my town, and my village? Because this is something that has become an existential crisis pretty much in every jurisdiction, in every place in the world. And I think we need to address this question in very concrete terms. And we have the technology, we have the solution set. And I think we have uh, now a lot of the social science and maybe even the political sciences uh, to try and address this question. And of course, this is a question of shifting perspectives. This is a map of you know, where the serious conflicts as far as water is concerned, something that uh, was presented at the World Water um, uh, Conference in uh, March this year. So the question of thinking differently, to, of thinking about place and location is quite important. So I guess the, the a core message I have here is you need transformational development. There are serious challenges with our development trajectories and pathways along with climate action. And that in a sense is a vector sum of the hyperlocal, local and regional action. We often forget this because we're involved in doing climate science at a very you know, large scale. The negotiations happen at national scale. And in my contention here is accelerating this is critically linked to granular climate projections at potentially at the one kilometer by one kilometer grid scale. We've been talking about this for a long time and we've made some progress, but I think this is where the frontier in AR7 lies uh, to be able to do that along with establishing a global network of observatories to ground truth this data. Because without ground truthing, given the diversity of processes given uncertainty, et cetera, uh, you know, our models will be only as good as the data that we have. So how can we bring this together? This is just a, a step on the development side. This is mapping that we've been doing in India for the last many years of, of each each province and state is one point almost four billion people. You know, Brazil does the same thing for all its municipalities. And then the same similar things for European cities. And you can see everything from Amsterdam to Zurich inside this. We need to be able to track stuff with the evidence and look at what's actually happening. So we brought this all together last year. This is at at, at Sharm el Sheikh at COP. We launched, uh, you know, a critical set of reports, uh, which was done by about sixty of us from um, the IPCC, but outside the IPCC frame, to try and bring the dialogue and a co-creation with policymakers, uh, with firms, and with communities across the world. So we ran ten consultations across the world to produce these um, three reports uh, from working group one, two, and three, sort of boiling down the eleven thousand pages down to about a hundred. And I think. The most important thing that came from this consultation was the need to downscale impacts and risk uh, at the local government um, and, and business level. That's the QR code. And I'll just quickly take you through why I think this is important. You know, climate resilient development is something that has brought, been brought together in AR6, uh, and it brings together four things, sustainable development, which I've just shown you, with climate adaptation, mitigation, and biodiversity conservation. Thankfully, now we have Kunming Montreal, so we have the opportunity from the science side to bring these processes together. And I guess the critical thing is we must recognize that we are in an urbanizing world and every system and place are connected, which basically means a change in one, you know, one system uh, regionally or, 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 or sort of um, continentally impacts the other. And I'm not talking at the moment even about tipping points and teleconnections. So every region will exper experience concurrent and multiple changes in the impact drivers. We know that most of this uh, have spent, spent our lives working on this question. But I think the core idea that, you know, I, I led the kind of negotiation on this in the plenary process was, uh, was countries and regions understanding and accepting the coupling between the climate system, ecosystems and human systems. And of course, um, you know, earth visualization engines, which is something that some of us are trying to sort of explore at the moment, are the key to understanding and navigating systemic risk across these three big systems. But one thing we shouldn't um, forget, and this is very critical, we're seeing this every day, uh, and that is climate impacts are felt disproportionately uh, by socially and economically marginalized communities, exactly what Tasneem was saying just now. So I guess we have a fairly clear idea of the systems, uh, the space that can address these transitions. So basically, there are these sets of five system transitions that can address couple risks uh, of human, natural, and climate systems, the energy system transition, which is pretty obvious. We've been working on this for 30 years, not doing too well, but in some parts of the world, it's improving. Industrial systems, which are going very slowly at the moment in many parts of the world, the greening of the production of steel, cement, uh, you know, concrete, glass, et cetera. The land, coastal, and oceans, and freshwater ecosystems, something that AR6 has really given us a good uh, sense of at the current point of time. The urban and infrastructure systems, exactly what the report that I just showed you, the three reports were focused on, and now we will have a special report in the beginning of AR7 of the IPCC. But the most critical thing I think that we've learned from uh, COVID is that societal choices and the transitions around social choices is actually critical. So all of these transitions 
advanced climate resilient development, bringing those four things together, sustainable development, adaptation, mitigation, and biodiversity conservation. Uh, the key thing, of course, is that we do know what the option space is like. I have to lead this process that's there. I'll just show you what they look like for adaptation, uh, where we're trying to look, we looked at the key risks that we're, we're talking about, you know, half a dozen key risks there, looked at the mapping of that onto the system transitions, urban, land, energy, et cetera. And then looked at the, you know, a series of about 50 different adaptation options. But most important, we understand now which are feasible and which are effective. And more than that, we understand the synergy between mitigation and adaptation with, I think, pretty good literature and with the exponential growth in research in this, in, in, the, in this across the world. Uh, and of course, an increasing depth in the developing world, we actually have a fairly clear idea of what the solution space actually looks like. The same thing for mitigation. It's a common framework that we built uh, uh, during the 1.5 report. The question for us is how do we actually make the right choices in local context? Even mitigation choices are made in national and local context. So you can map the system transitions onto overall feasibility, and then most critically, the relationship with the sustainable development goals. So when I talk to ministers, when I talk to people uh, in policy making areas, people who finance processes, they understand that you can start with something like SGC3 on health and map that onto the uh, system transitions as far as mitigation adaptation is concerned. Or the other side, you can come in from the climate end and you can look at the interaction with the sustainable development goals. So we do have an analytical framework to deal with this, and this has now been implemented I would say in, in, the, in, in the literature, in assessments at regional scale, and I think increasingly at local and national scale. Um, so I'll just run you through them very quickly. The energy system transitions in which cities have a critical a part, pretty obvious. The industrial transition, that's not going very well because we really have to limit material demand, redesign, you know, redesign standards, building codes, uh, and uh, reuse and recycle waste. The land and ecosystem transitions, which are very important because you know we're living in an urban world basically means that cities don't produce much of their food and their water and the ecosystem services. Uh, so you need to bring them all, all together. And then, like I said, the societal transitions. This was a big surprise for us in AR6, uh, where we were able to show that, you know, somewhere between 30 and 50% uh, of emissions can be addressed through demand side strategies as far as that's concerned. So this is very clear. The global community has a map of the CRD space, but cities and regions are going to play a critical part in the implementation we need highly granular data to enable inclusive and context-specific decision-making. And that's, in a sense, a call to action for you. And I close here by saying that cities and regions hold the key to climate resilient development and global to global actions, local to global actions, have a central role to play in the system transitions and the future transformations. The transitions themselves are just a stepping stone to a transformative set of actions which are needed because we know exactly uh, where we may be going in terms of a 1.5 or 2 degree overshoot, because unfortunately, uh, in the climate negotiations, we're negotiating between 2.7 um, and 3.2, because of course, as we know, uh, our climate is our future. So thank you very much. And uh, it's been a pleasure being with you. Thank you so much, Arama, also for a very comprehensive, thought-provoking presentation. And again, Think about that one liner that we're gonna pick up in the Kigali Declaration. I love the quote, every country is a developing country that might stir some feathers.